Hello YouTubers, this is another session where we get to explore and learn about so many different engineers from all around the world. You know, a few days ago, this brother here, Tim, you know, reached out to me and he was talking about some amazing projects he's been working on where he can automatically generate an API, you know, in the simplest possible way, just in a few minutes. Tim seems to be very, very dedicated to technology. We had a couple of chats. I immediately, I fell in love with him immediately. He's a smart guy. He wants to, you know, put a dent in the universe and build something new. You know, um, Tim, do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes, yeah, sure. No, no problem. Um, since I can think pretty much, like I was, I don't know, 14, 15, maybe I'm working in tech. Like 14, in, 15 it, years, nice. Yeah, nice. I think mm -hmm. so. It initially started, I was playing Ultima Online actually. So that mm -hmm. was back in 1904 or something. Mm -hmm. And then figured you can actually run your own uh, your own server. So we ran a couple of uh, free shards, what it, uh, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, Ultima Online game servers. And then we created the website for our own server and then managed all the things. So uh -huh. that's uh, basically HTML, some form of scripting, if I remember right, ages ago. Yeah. And then fell in love with tech, pretty much. And then did a normal apprenticeship in, in Germany. Um, nice. That was. So, so you're from Germany originally? I'm uh, still in Germany. Yeah. You're I'm still from, in Germany? From Germany and still in Germany, yeah. I, I I don't know my German is really you know rusty but let's see let me test my German ich ich heiße Hassan ich komme von Ägypten is that right am I yeah, saying that's this right, right? Yeah. yikes okay yeah. let's yeah. go <laughs> perfectly perfectly fine <laughs> okay all right uh, well I think I started with .NET 1.1 um, nice actually with uh, no I did a little bit of VB6 that was bad dark memories that so. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah, always stayed in tech. I was always working in, in tech in various companies um, for software develop. Well, for companies working on a software product, I was even working in the IT department for like a normal company. Let's call it like that. Nice. Um, helped with various things around mostly Microsoft technologies. So I was mm -hmm. pretty much always working in Microsoft area in some mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. uh, did some yeah, like Lotus Notes to exchange migration, stuff like that. Nice. Um, but my, my passion is around software development. And I'm 40 years old now, and um, I often think about what, what I can do like with my career. Like yeah. there's tons of people who can code, but yeah. there's not so many people, well, a lot less people with tons of experience. That's right. So I, I actually enjoy a lot of like, yeah, giving back, writing blog posts, um, building nice SDKs, like helping people have an easier time working on things pretty much. Making things easier is, yeah, I, I really enjoy that. You know, in many ways. That's, that's actually a very good point. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been searching this myself. You know, I thought to myself, you know, what's the difference? Like there's a lot of people that are writing code out there, right? How do you tell the difference between one and another? And then I ended up, I don't know if you saw this before, but I ended, ended up creating a system, you know, for you know, to be able to kind of categorize the experiences and the impact of a particular individual versus another, you know, and then I ended up with something very interesting. You might find this interesting. Um, you know, there is this thing that I call the standard, you know, where mm -hmm. you basically, you know, look at, at what you do and, and your contribution and it basically helps you kind of, you know, understand, <clears throat> you know, your, your impact and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I went and built a nice system. Let me just show you. I thought, okay, if we're going to work like this, there are coders. These coders are just your everybody who writes hello world. That's a coder, right? Someone who just mm -hmm. writes some code, great. And then you have a programmer, someone who can build a specific part of a system, maybe just, just back end, just front end, you know, just mobile, just, you know, th these are programmers. And then you have developers and these folks can build you end-to-end -end features from all the way from the api all the way up to the ui and back right so these they can write software this way and then i ended up you know needing to define what an engineer really is mm -hmm. and an engineer doesn't just build things end to end they design they visualize you know the problem into models and simulations and then they, they deliver a whole system out of that and then on top of that you have innovative engineers the people who don't just design and implement 
they innovate new technologies. People like, you know, David Fowler, you know, yep. he, he invents ASP.NET Core, right? So they innovate and then they use what they innovated to kind of solve problems. And then a little bit further to that, you'll find in entrepreneurial engineers. These are folks that don't necessarily um, uh, innovate a lot, but they can run a business while actually being aware of, of the technology they're working on. Uh, a great example of this is, uh, you know, the Facebook guy, Zuckerberg. He didn't really yeah. invent Facebook. It wasn't his idea, right? But he was engineer enough to drive it and develop it and then go sell it, right? So that's entrepreneurial yeah. engineer. And then the last last group of people is entrepreneurial innovative engineers. And these are folks that are, they can run a business, they can visualize and design, but they also invent their own technologies and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know? And these are very rare people. Like, you know, you look out there, there's very rare people. So there's a system. I had to kind of make sense out of the world one way or another. But enough uh, about, <laughs> go ahead, there, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. There, uh, there, was, there was a discussion on, on, on Twitter, like, yesterday i think where someone asked what the difference between the coder a developer an mm -hmm. engineer and an architect is mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and uh, i always think that an engineer and an architect is actually the same it's just a yeah different it's very much the same thing an architect who does designs but can't materialize them you know yeah usually yeah. The, here's the thing with architects and i've seen this a lot they end up in a situation where the design is done and they're just sitting there Mm -hmm. Right. So my advice for anybody that's an architect, learn some code, man, materialize your ideas, because otherwise you're just going to be sitting there, you know, just waiting for the engineers to, to, to get the work done. It would be not much, much fun. It even do you think I think that an architect who writes code, which is an engineer to me, you know, is someone who can make better decisions about their design. Like if you don't understand how cues work and you know you actually did it yourself and wrote with it i remember you know some some five or six years ago you know i worked with an architect at john deere he could he could write code he could actually sit down and solve problems but it just so happens that his title is an architect that's true it, it's weird in in germany well i met people who like evolved into an architect role from being a programmer or bringing a coder or whatever we call it. Mm -hmm. And so they actually worked on code and then they said, oh, I actually want to be an architect. That works quite well because they, they've been there, they, they did all that, they know how to code. And then on top, they learned all the architectural things. And then I've met people who actually studied software architecture. They never actually worked in the programming job. They never mm -hmm. really wrote their own tools. Yeah. Yes, these guys have like, crazy ideas can can create crazy schematics and all that but it's actually really hard for them to talk to the developers in times and to to explain the developers like what they actually have to do yeah so there's a huge gap quite often and yeah quite, yeah quite annoying yeah. It, it, it costs frustration and people say these guys it's like uh it's like the ux folks you know they'll design something you know almost impossible in ui be like, mm -hmm. yeah, I want the button to flip up and down and jump and go sideways. I'd be like, oh, well, great. You know, go ahead, sit down and code it. Show me how that works. I'd love to see that. Anyway, you know, uh, back back to your to your yep. work. I, I really appreciate, you know, uh, engineers around the world. Just, just, just a reminder, I am always on the lookout for unknown geniuses. People are out there that didn't get the spotlight or the chance to kind of you know, communicate their genius to the world, you know, and it's not nothing that it just so happens that, you know, doing pranks and throwing iPhones from the ninth floor is much more appreciated than actual engineering and actual science. Mm -hmm. And people are actually pushing humanity forward, you know, what that, that the mind and brain behind that iPhone that is being tossed from the top floor. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. But I think, you know, the attention and the appreciation should be directed more towards scientists and computer scientists and engineers. So tell me about this invention of yours. Where, where did you get that? Where did you come up with that idea? And you know, well, what's the, your motives and tell me everything about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. The initial idea was um, like we were talking about uh, about new project we, we've been we are still working on mm -hmm. in the company I work for. And um, you quickly notice that there's stuff you do all the time, like there's things you do again and again and again. Yeah. And one of these things is uh, like building APIs, simple, mm -hmm. simple CRUD APIs. Yeah, sometimes even more complex APIs, but especially like yeah, we want to store that log file somewhere. We want to yeah. store these tiny bits and pieces somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And in the in the microservice environment, you often like do things like, 
yeah, you just copy all your boilerplate code. You do the same again. And I was uh, like, and then uh, Hasura uh, came out actually. So mm -hmm. Hasura is doing something similar with with GraphQL. Mm -hmm. And um, well, in in some ways, uh, I'm not a real fan of of GraphQL for whatever reasons. I mean, me neither. It's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I'm very biased because I'm driving O data. So. Yeah, I mean, I was working for for Teamwork.com, so a mm. SaaS company, and we uh, are doing project management business. Mm. And we were thinking about what do we do with the API, mm. and uh, we thought about GraphQL. And then we realized now, ah, if you run your one a SaaS business, having a more traditional REST endpoint is a lot easier to maintain, a lot easier to improve performance on, and. Mm -hmm. um, GraphQL is great if you want to like build a small thing fast. Yeah, you know, it, it's great. You don't have to talk to the API guys. You just do things. That, that's a, that, that's the thing about a lot of these technologies, Tim. You know, you'll see like it could be like you know when I when I talk to the folks about GraphQL, you know, um, uh, I think I think the dude that I was talking to the other day, he was also from Germany. You know, I think his name is Michael Stape or something like that, and he said he said something to the effect of, um. See, the idea itself is amazing, but the presentation of that idea is too complicated. Like, why would I trade off four lines of code to turn my API into queryable magic, mm -hmm. you know, versus having all these complications that may or may not be easily, you know, understandable? See, a big mm -hmm. part about adaptability. Let, let me tell you this. Scala and C Sharp were born around the same time. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, C Sharp is all the way up there in terms of popularity, and Scala is really struggling its way up. Why? It's too complicated. You know, people can't wrap their minds around functional programming. It's a big aspect. That presentation layer of your technology has to be intuitive. You could have great, great core logic that makes your technology amazing, but if the presentation is not simple and intuitive, nobody's going to. That's, uh, that's one. One other point, actually, it comes from, well, if you're running a SaaS business, um, mm -hmm. and especially if, like, you know many people are using your API, you mm -hmm. want to, like, uh, have all the insights you can get on what the people are, do, are using your API for, which API mm -hmm. calls they frequently do. Um, you can do all these things with GraphQL. You can do logging for GraphQL, but it's a lot more complex than mm -hmm. doing the same thing for, for uh, RESTful endpoints. And, That's right. Um, yeah, here we are. So um, okay, so 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 back to your story. You know, you you're working in this company, and you realized, wait a second, we do the same thing over and over and over again, right? I remember someone telling me this. Is it a true engineers automate what they know so they can mm -hmm. come to work and figure out what they don't know, mm -hmm. right? That's engineering. If you're coming every day to work to do exactly the thing that you know exactly how to do, there's no engineering there. You yeah. know, go ahead. Exactly. Go ahead. So um, yeah, then I I I was actually uh. Looking at uh, this the stuff uh, Jeffrey's built that instant API thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, okay, that's a great idea, that's cool, but it's not magically enough in a way. Like he's uh, for for his stuff, you need like uh, you need an entity framework context, and you need to do quite a bit of stuff. And I was like, ah, no, there has to be more. So I can do a lot more. Yeah, yeah. And then I uh, had a look uh, had a look at quite a few things how entity framework actually works, how the ASP that net uh, pipeline works and mm -hmm. had to see, okay, when in when in all that do I actually have to do things to, like I wanted to keep the original ASP stuff working. I wanted to mm -hmm. do my magic, but wanted to keep the middleware working, wanted to keep all the controller logic working, um, like uh, Swagger, Swishbuckler, for example, I wanted to keep that stuff working. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I managed to do. And okay. now at the end, um, yeah, right, right now, well, it's a prototype pretty much. There has to be a, a lot more has to be done. But, of course. I mean, um, but if not, if you're not embarrassed by your first project, you didn't hit the market fast enough. So that's there's no problem there. You gotta yeah. <laughs> you gotta put you gotta put a draft out there. You know, exactly. I, I, I'll show you I'll show you in maybe in a couple of days or something. I'll share something with you that I'm working on these days. I'm really excited about. But uh, let's let's get to it. You know, yeah. show us your project. Yeah, you know, all right, here we go. All right, so, I can see your screen. Go you ahead. can see my screen. Okay, so uh, what we have here is we are in this. Uh, this is the API generator, right? This is the API generator. That's currently the name. It's called uh, API generator, 
I probably might give that a proper name at some point, but TC TC is Tim Carden Bach. Bach. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, I got it. TC TC Dev is the domain I use for ages. I, I all think your, I own all your own, stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's not a company. I I own that domain since like twenty years or something, and I keep nice. using it for various things. It's my email address <laughs> since ages, and yeah, it's, it's a good investment. Someone is gonna come in and dump like a hundred thousand bucks and tell you, please give me the domain name. Uh, you probably. Know. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. uh, so um, yeah, I I leave all the uh, well, I leave all the magic out for for now, and and just show mm -hmm. you the, the sample. So mm -hmm. this is a sample that's actually using using all of my my library and all all the stuff, and there's two ways you can build an API. You can just build a class, pretty mm -hmm. much like like you like you just know a model, mm -hmm. just a model. Yeah, there's various options you can uh, you can define which endpoints you want to have. So if uh, you can say all all is default, so you don't have to say that. You can say oh no, we I only want to get endpoint. If mm -hmm. you're using an existing database, for example, so if you're using that model to connect to an existing database, you can say, "Hey, I only want get," or "I only oh, want only want in the." Oh, you define which endpoints you want to generate. Yes. As a oh man, that's pretty cool. Okay, keep going. Nice. So you can nice. say, "I only want in the or, or whatever." So, um, and then there is more options here. Well, you can you can see all of them here. A lot of these are not actually implemented yet. Uh, yet. Nice. Um, it, nice. The idea is, and that's stuff I'm working on right now. So there, you will be able to uh, do authorization using JSON Web Tokens mostly. Um, so you can set. Uh, you will be able to define the scopes needed to access that. So either mm -hmm. to write or to read. So just pretty much that, and mm -hmm. then it it will work with any any JSON Web Token. Like you can use Auth0 or uh, Azure B2C or whatever, anything that creates a JSON web token with scopes or maybe even with claims can be used. Doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, I'm also adding like caching. You can have your API endpoints cached by either using an in-memory cache if you're just working on a small thing or maybe even with Redis. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also an option to have your uh, endpoints throw events uh, in the form that it's probably using Azure Service Bus nice. or RabbitMQ, and that's all done automatically. You just configure it once, and it's it's all done pretty much automatically. And nice. as it's um, .NET Core based, yeah, you can obviously, uh, if you have the class, you can build your own controller. If you want to do some custom stuff, yeah, then just add your own controller and do it. Nice. Because you can you have all the all the freedom you want to do. Okay. So. Um, yeah, by doing that, pretty much, um, we can we can start that for a second. This is um, gonna start generating, right? Or is it? Well, it's not. The thing is, it's that's why I think the name is not too good. Uh, can yeah. you see that? Yeah. So that's the uh, yeah, that's the stupid name. I was playing around, <laughs> playing playing around with that. Um, uh -huh. So uh, as you can see, it's it's a normal normal CRUD API. You can use it. You can you can add a car. I hope my database is running right now. Yeah, it is. So you can add something that it, it's working perfectly fine, like you would expect it. Uh -huh. um, the thing is, uh, like, it's not generated as such. So someone was asking me, hey, I dig through your code. I don't find any 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 code getting generators, or how are you actually doing that? Uh -huh. So um, the thing is that I'm not actually generating code. Um, if you uh, look at that, I have just one generic controller. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you can throw like any type at that controller. Ah, I see. And yeah, at at runtime, uh, especially using my my attribute, um, open the class again. So I have that uh, I have that attribute, which is mm -hmm. my own thing I built. Mm -hmm. And based on and uh, on startup, I check all the classes as, uh, which have that attribute, take these and generate a controller for that. And generate mm -hmm. all the all the entity framework stuff for that, and by doing mm -hmm. that, you keep everything else working as as it would normally. So it's just that stuff is is done at, at, at runtime pretty much. Gotcha. But then you know someone might you know I'll be the the devil's advocate here. Like you know what if I want to like I want a specific controller for the car because I want to do some customization to it. And I know this is just a draft. You're you're playing around. You know there's. Mm -hmm. There's still this is maybe alpha stage, but you know usually like 
there is standardization for building API endpoints and all that kind of stuff. Totally agree with you. Uh, the other day I had to think about, you know, creating a custom HTTP verb, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'll talk about that in my channel, you know, in a couple of weeks or something like that. But, you know, the the idea here is that the reason why people love generating code, you know, these, these auto generators and stuff like that is because, you know, you want the code to, to happen, but then you still also want to go and specifically for particular pieces of information, you want to add some customization. Mm -hmm. Right. So how how would you solve that? Go ahead. Well, in some way you can do that already. Um, so first of all, you you do, you can write a class, mm -hmm. um, but there's also another way to generate endpoints, which is just plain JSON. Um, because nice. as, as as you just saw in the Swagger file, yeah, this is also a fully working API endpoint. And ah. this is also a fully working API endpoint, and as and the card JSON endpoint is actually using, uh, yeah, that's a bit as, as you can see, it's a bit. Uh, yeah, 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 you're just, uh, you're just trying with with different things to see yeah, how it works. Exactly, and that is also creating a fully working endpoint. Everything is working, and you can do it either in JSON or, as you can see, in that uh, project I did both. I have work classes and and JSON. I see. And, um, mm -hmm. Another thing is that I actually completely forgot how I did that. Uh -huh. uh, before, oh yeah, exactly. Before create, and um, you can even hook into things like that. So. Um, so what does that do? Oh, it basically. It's just a hook. So you have you return you return a car. You can actually make that async. And you, and get, you get to add custom functionality in yeah, there. Yeah, you can ah. do whatever you want in here. You, re, you return, so you get that item that's created. You can uh -huh. modify it in any way, whatever you want. So in that piece of code, you can do whatever whatever you want, and then re return the car that's actually being being stored in that in that in that event. And there's an event for literally uh, literally everything. There's before create, there's after create. There nice. is um, there is before update. Uh, uh -huh. which is pretty much that's the, for the, the put. most yeah. that's for the put. Uh, yeah. that I think that's pretty much the most interesting because um in the before update as you can see you get the uh, you get the current mm -hmm. which is currently stored and you get the new item which is supposed to be stay saved and, and then you, you do can, whatever you want in there you can do your own comparisons uh, validation rules uh, whatever you want really um ha interesting yeah. go ahead go ahead and go ahead. the last piece is pretty much that as everything all that is uh, entity framework based you can uh, implement that entity uh, type configuration which is um, and then you pretty, tell it uh -huh. entity type configuration is pretty much what you do in entity framework to um configure. the db set mm. exactly that's the db set uh, you can th here here you can in, if you wanted to you can say to for example oh, i want to give the table a special name or whatever Nice. So nice. you can also also do that. So um, the thing I wanted to achieve is that um, you can start with a really, really minimal set. You can even use an in-memory database if you want to. So it, you don't have to use SQL. You can use an in-memory database. So um, I have that here. This is pretty much the minimum. I was playing around with things. So this is pretty much the minimum you have to do. This gotcha. is a fully working API, and then from there you can add on and and do more things, whatever you need. And nice. Can it, it's pretty much as complex as you want it to be, so to name it like that. And and if I wanna like usually with 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 a more complex APIs at a, at the enterprise level, you know, let's let's imagine this scenario together. Let's say. You want to build an end-tier kind of architecture for your API. So you have a controller and you have a service and then you have a you know a broker or this is where your your entity framework lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would imagine you would do something similar in terms of uh, Im implementation from the interface. This this mindset is amazing. Like how you you're basically saying here's my model, inherit from these interfaces, and then go generate. Mm -hmm. Well, not even generate, like just dynamically uh uh dynamically add this so you're keeping the fault the focus 
100% on your model. Exactly. And you're letting everything else, which is just boilerplate, mm -hmm. you know, gets, you know, dynamically constructed in memory. That Man. <laughs> one of the things, yeah, one of the things I had in mind is that, um, like, well, this is all my, my own project pretty much, but in the company I work for, um, we have people working on various technologies because it's consulting business and people have to, yeah, sometimes work in Java or sometimes work in .NET and people mm -hmm. are jumping tech quite often. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find something that um, even people who don't know .NET Core and all the details and don't know exactly what a middleware does, what a controller does, and maybe don't know all the details, they they definitely are able to, and build to write a model. Yeah. yeah. So everyone is pretty much able to write a model. That's not a big deal. And you don't have to know all the other details around. Nice. Nice. That was pretty and, much and, the idea. And you could even add validations based on the properties type because the model is where everything starts, right? It is your actor, right? So you could um, go and say, I want to, for instance, I, the name cannot be null, empty, or white space. You might yes. resolve to required something like this or i didn't uh i didn't test that yet but okay. uh, based on how i did that uh, even if you use all the all the attributes and all that that should work that should technically work gotcha that should technically work yeah i didn't try that but, okay don't, uh, don't, don't trust that email address attribute too much though you know <laughs> <laughs> this email <Nope>. address <laughs> this email address attribute if you pass null to it it will say it's valid well, null is a valid. Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh -huh. Well, no, well, it's just that everything you have here, it's just yeah. a class. Well, and the other thing is with the um, with the classes you define in JSON, that's actually done. By, I actually have to find where I did where I do that. Uh, let's start from the other other way around. This is crazy. Uh, this is mo this is model focused yeah. architecture. So um, <clears throat> that is uh, just really just test code right now because mm -hmm. I'm pretty much using what I did here with writing a class. I take the JSON layout and just just generate the class. Just generate myself. that. Oh man, that's that's it. That's it. So right there. that's it. And then it's using Roslyn and then just compiling compiling the class and adding it to the library. That's about it. That's that's amazing, Tim. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, in my head, you know, you could you could really save hundreds of hours, you know, building systems like these. If you just especially if you're doing something for you want to spin up an API real quick, right? As soon as fast as possible, you want to be able to spin up a an API. All you have to worry about is the model and then everything else the pipeline, the entire pipeline is generated for you. The That's idea amazing. is pretty much to, um, well, I'm, I'm not there yet. I was just playing around with things, but the idea is pretty much, and that's why I have that, that JSON mode, let's call mm -hmm. it like that. The idea is that you can just uh, spin up a Docker container, mm -hmm. put it, uh, load some JSON, and you have a, you have a working API, and that's all you oh have to do. Oh my God. <laughs> because everything else can be done automatically. And um, right. may, maybe you get a small mini admin front end. Well, the idea, you can easily build something like Hazura with that. So I can easily yeah. evolve, evolve that into something really similar because from from here to Hazura, there's, of course, Hazura is a really complex product, but there's not so much difference here because like if I had a front end for that, if I had some sort of, sort of admin front end where you can just define the tables and define the, and just the like model, just yeah. to generate and it, it it brings up a fully working api and uh from from what i have to that it's not that far nice and that's nice. actually the, the idea behind so this this will evolve into some uh yeah just just deploy to azure add some json here you are and it'll be interesting to see like uh, l let's see how would you tackle pro a problem like this like you know let's say you're you're creating an endpoint that allows students to register at a school right and you want to add some orchestration in the middle of your api that goes and says hey check the student exists first check that the student status is enrolled and then go ahead and register them to that course this this branching off of logic is where the complexity is 
how would you how i know that your system today doesn't necessarily tackle that but would you just add it in the before create like call a different this is cross model communication mm -hmm. like like what you have here as far as i understand it your you're focusing on the one model pipeline. You're going from the database all the way up to the API. Yeah, the idea is that um, I'm not there yet, but I already had the had thought that in the in these let's call them hooks, mm -hmm. you probably need, need the whole data set. So you, yeah. you probably want to have the whole DB context in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do your own queries here to compare things and to do things. And um, well, you more than can also do an API call here or whatever. So you mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. do pretty much every everything you want in here. And um, if you have access to the DB context here, you can even run cross checks to other other places in your database. That's right. That's right. It's not it's not in here yet, but that's basically the idea idea I had. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And you also have the nested models. I see the make in there in your uh, in this current model. So you could have nested models and they're like a uh -huh. A, a registration request could come in carrying a student model in it, you know, but ideally people will say just, just put the reference, you know, to the student. And if the student is in the database, that's great. If it's not, it's not. Exactly. And um, that's uh, yeah, that's actually then if you're using uh, or as the whole thing supports all data. Oops. Actually, oh, you're going to have to remove the, the hooks uh, because of that. Yeah. I broke a, a, broke a few things. <laughs> um, well, normally, it, it, normally you would you would have to tell entity framework, yeah, give uh, give all the navigation properties to include. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. that's actually uh, GitHub Copilot doing mm -hmm. weird things here. Yep, um, yep, yeah. I know. The, the, try to do Alt plus. It will keep. Yeah, click Alt plus period. Uh, sorry, Alt period. Ah. It will it will keep kind of shuffling if there is other suggestions. It will keep shuffling until it finds something that you like. It's crazy. That's that's nice. I didn't know that. That's yeah, handy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So normally, um, the way Entity Framework works, you have to tell Entity Framework which navigation properties you want to have. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, we can't do that because I don't know. I can't write the query for that easily because I don't know all the navigation properties someone has. Uh, yeah. It actually, actually, had a card. Yeah, you want to create one first. Yeah. That's the one with the make, I think. So if you execute that, you get a car, but the make is null. You have Obviously. to include. You have, you have to, to include, include it, it because, and you can't do that easily in Entity Framework. And this is actually uh, why I love there's OData in here because now we can just we can just go here, we can just run run the get, and we can say like uh, we can use OData. Uh, what about it? Expand make. Wow, um, this this O data thing make. is awesome. What is this O data thing? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's the interesting part is that O data works so similar to to entity framework in some ways. Yep. That especially creating the model. Yeah. It all works straight away. Yep. You don't have to. It it takes it takes two seconds to figure out how O data works. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's amazing, Tim. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking in my head, man. You could write a manifest in JSON. And this manifest has all your models and endpoints and all the places, and you could just push it into a Docker container, like you said, <laughs> and it'll just build your entire infrastructure for you, just like that. You know, the entire infrastructure. That's crazy. <laughs> and the thing is, um, I was even concerned a little bit about about performance, and and then I realized that um, for .NET Core, it does .NET Core doesn't care if the if the class exists physically as a file or if you load yeah. it yeah. using Roslyn or whatever. It'll fly. It'll it, just fly. It just doesn't <laughs> care. So it, it doesn't make any difference. That's awesome. Um, what are you what are you planning to do with this idea? What's the next step? What's the big thing that you want to do with this idea of yours? Yeah, uh, like like I explained. Well, the the idea is if I ever get there is to turn that into like. Uh, pretty much a product product similar to Azura, just mm -hmm. using using with with distinct differences. I mean, uh, GraphQL is probably something. Yeah, I might add maybe at some in ten years, whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely no priority. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much really similar to Azura, but um, yeah, 
based on OData, completely .NET stack. You can easily, with just a single button, deploy to to Azure and have it running in there. And it's like working in the whole Microsoft stack a lot better, probably. Nice, nice. That, that's that's the idea behind. So that's just the the core technology, and I want to turn that into like yeah, a real product you can just uh, pull from from Docker Hub and and run it. Nice, nice. And then I love uh, it. Yeah, and the idea is that then people can just jump in wherever they want. So if you are a citizen developer, yeah, you just use a container, you just uh, write some JSON. You probably can do that as a citizen developer. You should be able to. Mm -hmm. You just write some JSON, and you have your own working API. If you are a developer, you can say, ah, I might maybe want to do my own. Okay, you fork the thing. You just do a little bit of your own magic, and you run it. And if you're a hardcore developer, you use the SDK, you the library, and, and build the thing yourself. We were just talking about architects. I think that something like this would require... So see what you're doing with something like that is that you're targeting the learning curve, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know all the bits and pieces. Just the same way you and I don't have to know the bits and pieces of every single detail uh, underneath the Entity Framework, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing. You're just adding this extra layer on top of it, and you're saying, hey, if we just want to get something off the ground, we want to hit the ground running, mm -hmm. you're an architect, you know, here's here's one for you, Tim, and you might find this nice. You know, I like to use this application called Draw.io. You know, it, it helps me kind of design architecture and stuff like that. You could do an integration with it where you can design an entire architecture and then click Generate, and it will generate models for every microservice and every API, you know, in in a minute. You can literally just, you know what I mean? It's a fucking interesting idea, yeah. That it, it should, that's definitely doable, yeah. yeah. It's very doable. The only thing you would need to kind of think about is API to API integration. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. let me let me show you. Uh, so I'm gonna take your screen for a second, and mm -hmm. then so here's here's the deal. Imagine if you could just go and say, you know, I want to, you know, so back back talking about architects and stuff like that. You know, here's your, your model. So you have your models in here and you're defining that model just like that. And you went and said, okay, I have a student and this is an ID and my ID is a GUID. And maybe you want to go here and say, I have a name and maybe the name is a string, right? Like that, mm -hmm. right? And then you could have a bunch of things like these. All you got to do is just go and say, here's my microservice. This is my student's microservice. And all you got to do, like, assume that this is your architecture, you're just connecting this service to the model, mm -hmm. right? And then all you got to do is that just click a, a little button here that says generate. Hmm. Right. Well, it's, you actually, it's actually even, well, technically more more or less, the only thing you have to do is generate the, the API definition JSON file pretty much. And then you can yep. use it. Yep, absolutely. You know, I'm just saying, imagine like you're designing and the code is happening behind the scene. That's what they call no code, low code. Yeah, that's the one thing I, I hate about Visio, actually, that they uh, removed all the all these pieces. I, yeah. I don't like Visio. It's too, yeah, too complicated. It, it, it <laughs> is in a way, but it, uh, in older versions, there was a whole reverse engineer functionality in, in Visio. And oh, that actually, allows you to integrate yeah. and generate? Yeah. yeah. And you know they what? removed that. You know what's hot these days? You know, the Entity Framework team just introduced this. You might find this interesting. Let me show you. So there's this thing in um, in GitHub. If you're writing, let's go to GitHub real quick and let me show you. You could basically, let's just pick up any issue or any project, whatever the case may be. Let's go, go here. Let's let's pick up this. And let's just do this. So So there's this new thing where you can design your architecture on the fly you know, with code, mm -hmm. right? So uh, let me just, I'm trying to remember what's it called. Um, it's called um, something JS. If you give me a second, I'll tell you. I, I, I published something about it the other day and people really loved it because it was, the idea of it is that, you know, okay, you want to be able to kind of put scalable code in mm -hmm. your in your system. So when you're basically writing code, you know, you're, you're, you're designing with code, but it's something simple and easy that anybody can can do it. But also at the same time, you want to be able, yeah, it's called uh, um, Mermaid. 
mermaid. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. Right. So, so the Entity Framework team, not this mermaid, Mermaid JS. So, mermaid, if you go here, you can literally pick up a model like this, and I can go down here and I say uh, mermaid like this, and I can throw my models in there, and I can go to preview, and it generates that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So what? So what did I see yesterday that was very interesting? You know, from that pattern, the Entity Framework. The Entity Framework team decided to kind of integrate, you know, an explore with Mermaid, right? So there it is, classes to diagram. No, not this one. Hold on. I just saw it on YouTube yesterday. I hope I'm not crazy. There it is. Uh, let's see. Mermaid, Mermaid. There it is. You know, so this here, basic one to take control of DB context, auto-generate database diagrams that render from Markdown using yep. Mermaid. Yep, I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> how about that you know what i mean so so anyway they they go through the details in here they talk a little bit about they oh it's it's not live yet they're gonna go live in two days so it's it's not mm. there yet but the, uh, yeah. you actually said something said something there and that actually created some idea in my head as well like uh, tell me think of <clears throat> think of github actions for example uh -huh. so, uh -huh. um in theory you could probably have like a github repository which really only has your model. So which only has like two, three, four just C sharp files, only your model, and then a GitHub action takes that model, put that into, uh, into my library and, and and pretty much deploys a fully working API. And in the repository, you don't have all the boilerplate code, you have nothing in there except the models. That it should definitely be doable. Absolutely. <laughs> that, I mean, the, the sky's the limit with these kind of tools and what they can do, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to say the, something. The thing ahead. is, um, and that's something we often we often talk about, like uh, with with some colleague and, and other friends. Um, even explaining what my what what the stuff does, I'm I'm building. You have to have a specific mindset to understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think to think about all these things, to think about all the possibilities, pretty much, you have to have a specific mindset. Like mm -hmm. I was working with uh, Matt Heidinger. I'm not sure if you know him from the Adaptive Cards team. Mm -hmm. like, I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of things with Adaptive Cards. That's nice. why I became an MVP because I was doing a lot of things with Adaptive Cards. I built that yep. VS Code extension, stuff like that. Yep. So, but I was always, I, I did never really used Adaptive Cards to like build a Microsoft Teams app or like mm -hmm. use, use mm -hmm. it in Power Automate. I was always thinking, okay, we have UI snippets made with JSON. Hey, what, what else can you build with that? And I actually used Adaptive Cards to build a whole UI for a website uh -huh. because uh -huh. I was like, hey, there has to be more. But to think out of the box and to use the technology, maybe in some way it, it was never supposed to be used or at not the complete in, intended use case, let's call it like that. Just think yeah. out of the box, what else can I do with that? Yeah, that, that's what I really like, and that's that's what this is about as well. Because it was always like, okay, like we can make that easier. We can, like, make that simpler. And what else can we do with it? But you have to have a specific mindset for that, pretty much. Do you think there will be a point in time where you know Entity Framework, ASP.NET Core, and all that becomes just another layer that people don't talk about, and then there's something else on top of it that's doing all the work? That's the same way assembly. C and C++, like and there's a lot of C and C++, you Probably, know, underneath. Yeah, yeah. eventually yeah. technology will just add another layer and just keep going Yeah, the, the thing is, like, we have that group um, in, in WhatsApp. It's like three guys, uh, that's Luis Ries, uh, mm -hmm. Tomasz Poshitek, also MVPs, and we often talk about things. So I'm the core developer in that group, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Luis mm -hmm. is more a citizen developer. She, she can code now. She, she taught herself a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but she's more like the low code person. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about things. And like in, I would say, like maybe not in, in one year, maybe not in five years, but the coder today won't work on software anymore. So I'm yeah. pretty sure that at some point, people like me, people like the my other colleagues will work on tooling for people to actually build this, the software with it. Yeah, like we, we will all work on some sort of low code platform, uh, app builder or whatever, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I really think that that's sort of the future. I don't like I don't see myself working on actual code in 10 years. 
I think uh -huh. I, I work on tools for other people to build apps pretty much. That's I think that's where we, we are already going to in some way. Like yeah. You, Think of all the stuff you you can do already. Like think of all the webs, all the um, all the website builders, a, a power platform. Take power mm -hmm. platform. What can you build on power platform without actually be, uh, knowing how to code? Yeah, a lot. You can do a lot today with power yeah. apps, yeah. power platform. You know, it just lets you kind of stitch together. You don't have to worry about UI design. You know, you don't have to. Worry. It's it's low code, no code. You know, you go yeah. and. Just yep. stitch, stitch a bunch of things together. You want to do an integration? You want to talk to SharePoint? You want to talk to Dynamics? You want to talk to an external API? Whatever the case and may I think, be. I think the key is, and I think yeah, even Power Apps has to learn quite a few things here, but um, I think the key is that you have to be as simple as possible, um, but as complex as possible, if you get me. So um, it has to be really, really easy to build something, but if someone wants to get to dive in deeper and wants to do more customization, wants to do more stuff on his own, it should be possible. Yeah, yeah, it should. Be. You you still you still can allow them to dig a little bit deeper. This is why I asked you about the generation earlier. Yeah. You know, underneath you still want to go and say I want to tweak this a little bit. You know, so it does something else, like buying a a an out of the box you know PC you know that's already assembled and put together. But you still want to have the library to be able to go in and open it up and upgrade your graphics card or memory or whatever the case may be. That, that's a perfect example. You you can just plug it in and use it, or you can just open it and say, ah, I want more RAM. I want a, a different a different hard drive, whatever. Yeah. So so Tim, what other projects do you have in mind? What other crazy ideas are you thinking about these days? Too too many to count. Really. <laughs> way way too many. You know, I have a to do list. <laughs> You know, and I decided to split it into to do to do's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you run into all these things. I, I'll tell you personally. You know, I build tooling for myself that just so happens that someone else would use and find it interesting. Like a while back, I designed a library called Restful Sense to kind of you know streamline API communications. I don't want to serialize and deserialize and check the codes every time I call an API if it throws. A 404, then just throw an exception that says not found HTTP response and let me handle it properly the way onwards. And it just exploded. It reached 50,000 downloads, you know, and then people continue to, to ask more features and uh, off of it. And I'm adding more features into it. It just gets into a point where your library becomes a, a the tools that you use for yourself just happens to be useful for someone else, which is a great sign. And... It, it's a great sign, but um, to me, it, it's also always some sort of problem because like so i i like the thing i'm working on i yeah. i work on it but at some point you you have to think about so what do i do next so yeah is that actually good enough to like think about some form of pre-seed funding and think about like okay let's do that turn that into real product or do i get enough like with github sponsors or whatever to work on that full time and because otherwise if people really like it you get so many issues you can't work on that. You can't fix them all because you don't have enough time. If you do, if you have another full time job, and then people get frustrated because you don't help them. <laughs> yeah. And here we are. So it's always like it's hard to juggle all that, and that's why I'm happy I'm not running like five products at the same time. Like I have done every. So it happens so <laughs> often. Like, uh, like especially like having a shower, for example, it's like a really bad thing because you're there and like. Uh, and you, then you're thinking about things, then you get all the crazy ideas. Um, <laughs> and it, it happens quite often that I see something like it, it, just the other day I was talking uh, with someone about bot frameworks and, and uh, universal actions and how you still need to write a full bot just to build a small Microsoft Teams app. And I was like, eh, okay, we can actually make that, that. There has to be some way to make that easier. Simplify this, yeah. And yeah. there probably is. And mm -hmm. like, uh, but. Like, yeah, you can't at least for prototyping. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At least for prototype and proof of concept. And even even mm -hmm. like just talking to you now for like for what like an hour, I had like twenty different it, ideas. What no I ideas. Think can, can evolve into. <laughs> You you're know, putting, you're putting ideas in my head. That's crazy. <laughs> you, know, you know, I saw some people do something interesting with that. Like someone like um, uh, Steve Sanderson, mm -hmm. he would put a proof of concept out there on GitHub and say, whoever is really passionate about it, take the idea and run with it. 
by all means, go create your own product mm -hmm. off of it. You know, he did something similar with, you know, this, a testing framework for Blazor. You know, uh, I see people do that. They'll be like, I don't have the time or the capacity or the effort to maintain something like that. But I'm going to put the idea out there and say, here's how I solve this problem as a POC. This happens all the time, even, you know, in bigger companies. You know, you'll have, you know, some engineer that will come up with a proof concept that works. It works, you know, but it's not ready to be productized right there's a, a different you know crew of engineers that really love to go down to the deepest detail and make sure that every single line of code in there is written properly and test driven and all that kind of stuff it, it happens you know the one thing i want to you know kind of you know encourage you and share with everybody else out there you know don't let an idea stay you know just in the dark if you can make a simple poc and put it out there in the world you know at some point in time there's always people that are scouting going around you know looking at everything on github and seeing what's out there because there's a lot of useful information out there right right there's a lot of interesting projects out there um the one thing i always tell engineers if you have an idea just play around and put a proof of concept out there and if someone is interested enough they'll turn it into a reality if not yeah it's so funny like when i when i was working on that i was i was i logged into into nougat again to just upload my my uh, my package then I, I realized, hey, I actually have some older packages in there I completely forgot about and realized, hey, there's one of them with like 15,000 downloads. I'm like, okay, what that? <laughs> so I didn't even remember I ever ever uploaded that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what And, and that's, that's also like, I'm not sure if you, you ever had that, but the other day I was looking for some issue I can't remember what it was, a question about entity framework, no idea. And I ended up in Stack Overflow and found an answer and was like, okay, that actually worked. Okay. I, I used that answer and then realized I wrote the answer myself four years ago. <laughs> like, uh, okay. You're going out there finding your own answers. <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, Tim, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate yes. your time showing us this great um, application that you that you built. You know, I really hope to see more of you and I hope to see, you know, uh, you know, more uh, more ideas that you can come up with. You know, it's always interesting to communicate with software engineers from all over the world with your experience. Mm -hmm. Just for people watching, Tim is also a, a Microsoft MVP. He's a, he's, he's, uh, he's uh he's he's done his due diligence in the tech industry yes. you know and he earned he earned it fair and square um uh, you know tim do you have anything you know for the rest of the engineers out there since you know we're always exploring you know there's a lot of engineers that say i have a lot of great ideas but i just come from work and i just fall asleep and watch netflix what do you what makes you like what 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 do you want to say the software engineers out there that still live in the idea state and they want to put something out there like you're doing on GitHub. Like, for some reason, it, it sounds like you have heard that like a million times, but just like you said it yourself, just give it a try. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, just just try something, just talk to someone else about it, just tell someone, hey, I built that thing, what do you, what do you think of it? And just talk about it. And the other thing is that um, don't sit in the dark and just think for yourself. Like, I mean, um, Scott Handelman said that like uh, two weeks ago, we did a TikTok video and saying, and he ended the video with something I, I still have in my mind. It's like, at the end of your, your career, do you want to be someone who read all the books, who heard all the uh, all the conferences and who used a ton of libraries? Or do you want to be the one who built the book, uh, who wrote the books, who built the libraries and who gave the talks? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty, pretty impressive statement because I think that's something that's really, really important in, in the current engineering world, like how much you can give back. If I can tell someone how to write a piece of code, I actually multiplied my own experience in some that's way. That's right. That's right. And um, like writing a blog post in an hour or just writing a line of code in an hour with that blog post, I probably helped like 10 engineers write that line. Yep, exactly. And that's why I think like, just whatever you have, even if it's just a piece of code, put it on GitHub and tell someone about it and just share things, really. Absolutely. Because, um, even for myself, like I had, I was talking to quite a few people at, at, uh, at Microsoft from the Entity Framework team who helped me with, with smaller pieces and stuff, because you can't do all these things alone. Yep. 
you're gonna have to communicate you know this this is the power of this community right you know there there are answers out there our collective mind at some point in time, i think what this is what copilot is trying to do it's looking at github and trying to find the best answer for you so you don't even have to go look it up online and say hey what do you think about it? sometimes it blows my mind i was just hanging out with the o data neo team yesterday and i'm like how on god's green earth does it does it figure out something like that that's just it's scary it's sometimes it's just kind of scary yeah like what like you know how right but there's a lot of i need to find uh i need to find the dudes that did the co-pilot inside microsoft just talk to them bring it out on the screen so everyone knows you know who the co-pilot people are i'd love you know? to know that yeah <laughs> Absolutely. You sometimes, sometimes you well i'm i what i know is that it's a combination of the um of the method itself so of the function name and the comment so you can actually that that's the thing i just learned learned a few days ago you uh -huh. can write a comment and if you do the comment quite properly with like do this then do this then do this if this then do this and then you go there you go in there it knows a, a, um full function here it is you don't you don't even like i tried with if you go to copilot if, if you're writing on visual studio and say public class student it will try to guess the properties mm -hmm. of that student it'll say okay you know, 99% of the engineers said ID, name, date of birth. What else do you want to add in there? It's crazy, man. It's crazy yeah. business. And it, and <laughs> it's actually looking at what you have already in the solution because it, it takes that into account. Yeah. yeah thank it's crazy. You, thank you so much, Tim. You know, if you continue to build something or you come up with something new, if you, build, if you continue to build on this existing project, please feel free at any point in time. You know, the whole point of this channel is to kind of bring the attention to a lot of, you know, amazing software engineers like yourself. You know, uh, continue to innovate, continue to kind of invest, you know, into this this uh, work that you do. You know, this is uh, this is why I always tell people, I say, keep knocking the door. Eventually, it'll open, right? You know, what are you looking for? What are you trying to accomplish? You're trying to make things easier for the engineers. I see a lot of potential in the stuff that you're doing. You well, know. I hope I don't get any new idea because I want to continue <laughs> working on that because there's a lot of that's, poten that's... potential in here. And I just want to continue doing that. That's the thing. <laughs> I guess I guess if you have the right budget, like someone like Elon Musk, he has the right budget. He goes and says, okay, I want to do, you know, chips in the brain. Let me find a team of engineers and let them run with that. I want to do electric cars. I want to do SpaceX. I want to do, what is he doing the other day? He's doing robots now. <laughs> well, well, Elon Elon could just give me like what 0.0.0.0% uh, 000 percent of what he has. And I'm, I'm done. I'm fine. You're, you're good. You're good for the day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. And, you know, for the people watching, you know, uh, I will drop in the description all the links for Tim. You know, Tim is an amazing guy. He's very, he's always, I looked at whole, all of his content. He's always searching. He's always building. He's always sharing, you know, which is, you know, what Eagle Hansen would say. Eagle Hansen would say that's the 10x developer. The 10x mm -hmm. developer is someone who is helping you know many engineers around them in every way shape or form and that's how they're leveraging all their 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 capabilities and leveraging their skill sets thank you so much brother i appreciate you uh wh what do i say guten tag is that how you say guten tag uh, good, well in this case it's it's gute nacht so you want okay. to say good evening, good night gute nacht okay guten you tag know? was a good day so how, have a how, nice do you, day. How, how do you how do you say in german don't forget to like and subscribe is that a word that you can say in German? You never thought about it. <laughs> the, th the thing is that every single German stream I'm looking at always use, hey, uh, yeah, subscribe now here. So, uh, so, so they you just throw the little English word in the quite in often. the mix. That's yeah. that's what people do in every other language. Like I have uh, friends of mine, they come from all different parts in the world. and be like, I'm not going to bother translating this. I'm just going to you know, put the English word and people like CD, for instance. CD just you know just went all over the world and every every language just started calling it CD. You know there is a translation for it. It's just that it's not common and people really don't care. I would, I would you know? really have to think about a proper translation for subscribe. Yeah, how do you say? I don't, it? Like I don't what? Know. You know now now I'm curious. See that's the problem with curious people, <laughs> that you go and you say, you say okay we want to do something. Let's see subscribe. And then we can go into German. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's, uh, abonnieren? That, ab abonnieren, yeah. That's probably the word. Why, why the lady in the Google says abonnieren? 
and you're saying Abonian. Are, do you have like an accent or something? Is that what I it do. is? I have a really well from a German perspective. I have a pretty strong accent. Yeah, I live in the in the uh, metropolitan uh, rural, so uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure if you well. You probably know Dortmund. Or yeah, Düsseldorf. yeah, yeah. So of course, yeah. That's that's the area I live in, and we have a pretty strong accent, like a completely different accent to like people from Cologne or from Bavaria. Even Bavaria what, what, is a what, different what's an type example? of German. What's an example? What's an example? The most heaviest accent, like like here in America, you know, you'll you'll find someone saying, "Hey, hey, everyone!" In Texas, they say, "Way, y'all." <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't, I can't even. Yeah, it's it's there's so many. That that's tough right now. That we have we have different. The thing is, we have different different words, words for yeah yeah. I, I saw that. I saw and people do that. That's the most he, weird thing. And here in the... <laughs> time a time of day and i even had that with 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 my irish colleagues sometimes time of day is a completely weird thing yeah so in in germany you, you you have a thing that called uh uh translated it would be like quarter eight quarter two quarter to one whatever mm -hmm. and for some people uh like uh, quarter eight is uh 7 15. for yep. another dude that's uh 7:45 because yeah for the yep. fun dude it's it's like and that's it's inside 15 the same to, country yeah yeah so and that makes things sometimes really tricky <laughs> yeah. thank you so much tim i appreciate you and for the people watching us you know if you are someone who has an idea and you want to bring it out to the light i think i'm almost hitting 6500 now so let me bring that experience to people out there this is what I do this channel for. I try to make it like, you know, I'm always on the look for the unknown genius. Don't underestimate yourself. Look out there just like Tim did. He said, reach out to me. It's like, hey, Asana, I'm, I'm building on this project. What do you think? I was like, well, let's go on a podcast and let's start talking about it. I was like, now, now? Are you serious? Like right now? I was like, yeah, right now. Man, what, what else we want to do? You know, let's just hang out and let's talk, you know? Um, you know, if, if you have an idea, you know, if you have something that you want to share with the world, something that you think is great, please, by, by all means, you know, I'm the fastest person to jump in and try to put your content out there and point people to your genius and your amazing work. And Tim, thank you so very much. Danke. Is that mm -hmm. how you say Danke? Do you say yes. Danke or Danke? Danke. 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 Yeah. Danke. And good to knock. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me tell you something funny before before we jump. You know, sometimes I tell people, you know, I, I, I mess around with people, especially people, friend of mine from Germany, I would say, ich kann nicht understand what you're thrashing about. So I'm just kind of mixing a whole bunch of things together just to get them. That's, that's, that's that little laugh right there. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm just, uh, you know, trying to make people, you know, cheer people up and make them laugh a little bit. Thank you so yeah, much, that's, Tim. That's great. I really enjoyed all that. I appreciate you, brother. You have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye.